Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode five of Ally Meekly, the podcast. Oh. Today, we're going to be talking about foods that originated in Los Angeles. Oh. We're gonna... What? I ate too much for the podcast. Are you going to stop moaning? Yeah. Good. We'll be talking about foods that originated in Los Angeles. Oh, gonna... oh my God. What'd you eat? A French dip sandwich, a cheeseburger, a chili burger. A cob salad, and I washed it down with an orange Julius. Oh my god. Well fine, just just stay down, okay? I'll do this by myself. Let me just get something to soothe my throat. What is that? It's a hot fudge sundae. Are you gonna eat the whole thing? There's a, a small militia forming outside this room. Uh, if you could hear them, uh, try to identify the voices through CSI oh, after they murder it. Okay. All right. All right. They're gone. They've passed. The plague has passed. They've all passed away. All right. So. Hello, everyone. I'm Greg. I'm Daniel. We're going to be talking about the native foods of our homeland, Los Angeles. There's a lot of food in LA, but we're wondering how much of it was actually born here mm -hmm. and what we can take credit for. Everything, but. What yeah. do we have a right to? Yeah, what what can I actually uh, feel some uh, loose pride for having little involvement in <laughs> other than just eating most of it? Food, that's what. <laughs> we each did research on three different... Uh, Native foods in LA, and we're going to be talking about uh, what the Wikipedia pages had to say about them. <laughs> so we wrote down all of the things that we researched. We put it in a bag that used to hold donuts in it, mm -hmm. and we're going to pull them out and just do what comes first. Because we couldn't decide what would come first. Anyways. Yeah. Was it the chicken or the egg that was created in Los Angeles? I believe it was the spaghetti. That's a... Callback. Callback. Okay, so first dish out of the bag. What's our first course? Uh... uh... Uh, New York style pizza. <laughs> so that was New York style pizza. Uh, what's our next dish? Rats. Um, French dip. I believe. I believe I'll be going first today. All right. Thank take you. it away. On français. <sighs> I'm going to be talking about the French dip sandwich, which originated at Philippe's. It could be Philippe's, it could be Philippe's, because the originator was French. His name was Philippe Mathieu. It was the home of the original and accidental French dip sandwich. Its current address is 1001 North Alameda Avenue. It's right at the outskirts of Chinatown. It's right near Union Station. It's right near Twin Towers. It's right near the gold, uh, the gold line. And where they parked when they were filming Batman. Oh, that's right. Yeah. We saw a lot of Gotham City uh, police. <laughs> Gotham City dip sandwiches. <laughs> Let's talk about uh, Philippe Mathieu. He was an immigrant from France who moved to Buffalo, New York in 1901. And before he came to LA in 1903, he opens Philippe's in 1908, and he humbly names it after himself. <laughs> you know. There's so many humble people in the yeah, district of Los Angeles. <laughs> I want my name on that. <laughs> I want my name on that sandwich forever and on. <laughs> you know, that accidental sandwich? When he first opens it up, he starts serving like just normal sandwiches, roast beef, roast pork, roast lamb, liver pate, and... Blood sausage. Everyone's favorite uh, blood sausage. Yeah. He had a, different couple, a couple different spots. He was first on Alameda on 300 North Alameda, and then he moves around a couple times from 246 Aliso to 346 Aliso. He had a good spot for a while, but then they built something there um, called the 101 Freeway. So they moved <laughs> Never heard of it. I don't know what it is. I haven't done an episode on it. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so he moves here and there, keeping Philippe's uh, going. He creates a couple different restaurants around that general area, but they're all really unsuccessful. So he finally lands at that spot right there at uh, 1001 Alameda. Let's skip ahead 10 years. Ooh, it's 1918. Now there's three stories that have the origin of the French dip. Which is gonna be a theme this episode. There's always at least two or there's three a, yeah. origins for every food. All good foods in LA have folklore, <laughs> which is the only folklore in Los Angeles. The first story comes from him and it, it was uh, taken by LA Times reporter in 1951. And it was just basically, this, the story is just that there was an accumulation of gravy in the pan and there was a customer who was like, can you dip my sandwich uh. in there? And he's like, yeah, okay. And he, he did it for the customer. 
and uh, and then the Do customer it slowly <laughs> dip it in like my mother would, <laughs> whatever that means. And then um, he would the, the customers would just come back and ask for that. He had a nickname uh, Frenchie, uh, probably the dog derogatory. I'm gonna go ahead and say it's either um, he never heard that nickname. <laughs> Nip name. <laughs> yeah, it was either either really endearing or it was probably derogatory. Probably derogatory, but it's like, hey, Frenchie, go ahead and dip that sandwich in. <laughs> God, <laughs> this is not a fun story. <laughs> but anyways, that's that's what he claims happened. Some of the other stories that happened, which a lot of his family members, this one they say is probably true. A fireman came in and complained that his sandwich I heard this story that was too stale. So in a sign of protest. He dipped the, the the sandwich in gravy and like there it's too stale and it's it's wet for you <laughs> the way you like it. Anyways, um, yeah, because he would have rather done that than trash the roll or take um, take jive from a fireman. That's how you know he was truly the father of that sandwich. <laughs> he'd rather dip it in gravy than see it destroyed. <laughs> he probably called him Frenchie too, and then that sandwich also caught on. The third story, although this is um, they you know Matthew said the first story was the original uh, the real story. Uh, and a lot of his family's members said that second one was true. This is the one I read the most. The story goes that he was making a sandwich for an officer of the law, a cop, and he dropped the sandwich in the uh, the gravy, the, the pan juice, and the cop didn't beat him senseless. <laughs> he actually enjoyed it. He, he, on a whim, was just <laughs> You like, get off easy this time, Frenchie. <laughs> and uh, he and, uh, and the officers uh, returned for the sandwich that was dipped in the, in the gravy juice. Okay. So what we can agree on is that gravy was involved. Yeah, it's the bottom of the pan. The, the, they call it gravy a lot. I know it's just pan juice. A jus, as I read a lot. That means with juice. Now, there's a big dispute in LA over who created the French dip sandwich. Mm -hmm. One corner, we have Philippe's, the original home, the French dip sandwich. Other corner, Coles Pacific Electric Buffet, original of the French dip is how they call themselves. Where is that? Coles I... is on 6th and Main. It's a very popular bar. They film a lot of Mad Men there. Ooh. It's right next to, it's the same block as... That's spoilers. <laughs> it's on the same block as the Cecil Hotel. Oh, God. So I won't be eating there. Probably not. I know someone who will, though. A girl. Coles claims that it invented the sandwich in 1908, when uh, the same year that Felipe opened uh, Felipe's. Coles owner Henry Cole dipped a sandwich in pan juice to accommodate a fellow named Jack. Hang on. Why do all these restaurants have so much pan juice sitting around? Roast beef sandwiches. Why, are there, why is there pan juice? Effort chef. What do I know? I just eat it. They put it in my mouth and I chew. Anywho, the story with Coles goes that he uh, was trying to accommodate a guy named Jack Garlinghouse who had really bad gum, so he dipped it in the sandwich to make it softer for him. This is why the story is suspicious, though. Neither Cole nor Garlinghouse were French, so why would they call it a French dip sandwich? Mm -hmm. Maybe because it was in a French roll? I don't know. Mm, but where did the roll come from mm -hmm. originally? I want to see papers. <laughs> But most of the credit goes to Mathieu. It probably makes Cole uh, very bitter because Mathieu was French. His nickname was Frenchy. His nickname was Frenchy. <laughs> he was from France. He used French rolls. And apparently, I read this, that the police officer in the probably made-up story, last name was French. Huh. A little too suspicious, maybe. Was it um, French Stewart? It was actually French Stewart. A lot of people know that about French Stewart. He's a very old man. This is why a lot of people think he's dead now. <laughs> yeah, Felipe's is a very popular spot now. It's one of the biggest tourist spots if you're mm -hmm. down. A lot of people stop by when Hugh they Hugh Hauser went there. Hugh Hauser went there. I watched that special. Mm -hmm. Boy, Hugh Hauser. <laughs> How, Boy, did he go there. <laughs> he went there. A lot Let of people think you. he wouldn't go there. He went there. <laughs> they have something called a double dip, which I'm, I'm not a big fan of the French dip sandwich. I went to Felipe's once when I was a, a child. I just don't like the French. I went there when I was much younger and I didn't enjoy it. Maybe as an adult with um, slightly better taste buds, I'll enjoy it. But they had something called a double dip bunch. I'm really interested. The single dip is just they, they dip one side of the bread, double dip both, both sides both of the bread. Breads. It's a soggy, as dripping sandwich. Is, by the time you sink your teeth into it, the bread is gone. It's mostly mashed potatoes at that point. <laughs> There's an etiquette to Felipe's as well. Be careful when you go there. Lines form in front of a long Deli yeah, display it's counter. kind of confusing. Yeah, though. and there's carvers at both sides, mm -hmm. and they, they accommodate your uh, deli needs. It's cash only. Which I have many. You, this is the most pompous deli shopper I've ever seen. It's cash only. Mm -hmm. Take some cash out. and that's No gold? No, they take the blooms. Cash only to keep the line speedy. The whole thing about this place is that it's speedy. A lot like uh, another place I'll be talking about later. Mm -hmm. It's very speedy there. They want to keep the lines going. It used to be a 24-hour spot. Now it's open from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m., which is very uh, uh, good hours. Okay, that's good enough. You can wait a minute. Why are you getting a French dip at 6 a.m.? 
cops. Oh, uh, yeah. They love their French. They don't know how to sleep either because there's so much crime in the city. And Pig, pigs eating beef. <laughs> <laughs> Easy now. <laughs> and this is, I found this very useful on their website. When you're done eating, the busters take your trash out. Okay. I've, so many so many meals have been ruined wondering if mm -hmm. I have to clean up after myself at the end or not. Holding a, a plastic tray looking for a trash can <laughs> and wondering if you're rude for leaving it. Don't worry about it. They pick it up. Talk about their mustard. They have some of the spiciest mustard that, that goes with the uh, French dip sandwiches. Every video I saw had people almost tears in their eyes. Yeah, I can attest to that. It is very painful. Yeah, I, don't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend it to people who can't handle like Tabasco. <laughs> yeah, it's very spicy there. They're renowned for how spicy it is. Good for them. Uh, I know that they did close for a little bit a few years ago because they had a rat infestation. I heard about that too. I didn't read too much about that because everything I read was glorified tourist information. <laughs> but the same they thing- They had friendly furry little friends <laughs> coming over. Those little rodent pals, they love <laughs> they <partied> sawdust. Us. <laughs> they partied a little too hard, so we had to close for a year. Same thing goes for the pantry in downtown, which we also haven't talked about, but that they had a small rat problem, which they had to deal with really quickly because the mayor, that's like a mayor hot spot. Yeah. Every mayor eats at the pantry. Mm -hmm. That's where he goes to eat with rats, to make his <laughs> offerings to the rat king of Los Angeles. <laughs> the pantry is the middle ground between the two worlds. <laughs> Meet me at the pantry. <laughs> the gray <laughs> zone. <laughs> Have, you haven't eaten there any time recently? No, it's probably been about 10 years. Oh. This what? Is I, I ate there like two years ago, and I was kind of disappointed because the sandwiches were kind of small. Yeah, I heard that. But uh, the mustard is very good. I'll go and for, I just think for mustard shots. They had, <laughs> they had very good-looking lemonade also. Oh, really? And they have a lot of pies. Okay, I didn't know they had pies. Yeah, See, they you, got pies. You, you lived my research. I watched the Heelhauser. <laughs> we should have talked before this. I have a friend who runs a food blog. His name's Edric, and he, uh, he went to Flips, that and he, uh, he didn't like it. Really? Yeah. He likes everything. Most Does things. he like me? I can't even tell anymore. Whenever I say your name, he does blush a little bit. <laughs> or he might be getting red from <laughs> he anger. He might be getting yeah. angry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's pretty much it for, for uh, Frenchies. <laughs> that's it for the frog restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that the first thing that was picked was uh, what you said was your strongest I story. Know, so I now know. it's going to be a, a weak whisper of a finish from Greg on this one. Uh, so let's pull out the next one. Do you want to do it this time? I'll pull it. I hope so. All right, so I got hot fudge sundae, All right. which is mine. Oh, boy. All right, I'm ready to sit back and listen. Dessert has come early. <laughs> I really want one, though. First, the origin story of ice cream sundaes, because I love talking about ice cream. I bet. As we have already sort of alluded to, there's so many different ways. And this one also has three main stories about how ice cream sundaes, not hot fudge, but just ice cream sundaes came about. Okay. So one story tells that in 1881, there were two competing soda fountain owners in Wisconsin. One of them started using soda syrup as an ice cream topping and charged a nickel for it. The other one stole the idea but thought that a nickel price wasn't high enough, so as not to lose too much money on this concoction, <laughs> he decided to sell it only on Sundays, and thus the ice cream sundae ah. was born out of cheapness of a Wisconsin druggist. You could also save money by switching the Y to an E. He could also save money by switching to Geico. <laughs> <laughs> Saves him money. <laughs> Another story tells that in 1893, a reverend walked into a drugstore one Sunday and <laughs> the owner wanted to impress him. So he put soda syrup on ice cream and a cherry on top. And thus the ice cream sundae was born. Mm -hmm. So that's the second story. Third story, which sounds the most likely, it revolves around how in the late 1800s, the middle of the country got really weird and comically Christian <laughs> uh, to the point that they, the, a set of laws called the Sunday Blue Laws started mm -hmm. to get passed. And it forbade certain things from happening on Sundays, one of which was the sale of soda water, mm -hmm. which I guess was blasphemous. So in a town called Evanston, Illinois in 1890, a shop owner needed a product to sell on Sundays. So to get around the soda ban, he started putting soda syrup on top of ice cream and thus the ice cream sundae was born. This has been Evanston Meekly. <laughs> so whatever controversy there is, the hot fudge sundae was definitely invented in LA. Okay. A candy man named Clarence Clifton Brown. Mm -hmm. The candy man. Mm -hmm. Candy man can. He can make everything he bakes satisfying and delicious. Um, you can even eat the dishes. I think I skipped Cheer ahead. Up, <laughs> so, um, give me that gobstopper. <laughs>
No one ever goes in. No one ever comes out. There's a cabbage laundry soup. <laughs> so a candy man named Clarence Clifton Brown opened up an ice cream parlor downtown in 1906 at the intersection of 7th and Flower, and it was named C.C. Brown's. Mm -hmm. So hot fudge existed as a topping on other desserts prior to this place, but it was only a matter of time before somebody dumped it on top of ice cream. But my theory was that it took so long for people to actually do that because they were afraid to put the hot syrup on cold ice cream because the dish whose safety relies on being ice cold. So uh, it seems it's a risky endeavor. Here's your milk with hot fudge, which would also become a thing. <laughs> Even quicker, it'll curdle. <laughs> so Brown started serving ice cream in a tin bowl with almonds on top. I heard some people said that they were chopped, but other people said that they were whole almonds. Oh my god, can you imagine chewing that? I know. SOP. I'd eat it. I imagine. <laughs> Just to prove to the almond that you're better than it. And then they gave a little pitcher of hot fudge on the side for you to pour on top as you deemed fit. Instruction manual for food? <laughs> <laughs> so Brown made a gallon of hot fudge every day. Mm -hmm. And supposedly he would change the recipe every day for 20 years until he got the flavor just right. But that little piece of information came from their official website, so I don't know how true that, mm, that yeah, actually that is. Sounds like... sounds like what? Bull honky? Were you going <laughs> to say bull honky? <laughs> I was going to say uh, that dog don't hunt is what I was going to say. The fudge was made in the same... <laughs> Around the corner, perhaps? I think there was a lemonade stand also. <laughs> oh, sorry, you were saying? <laughs> uh, recess just ended. <laughs> so, the fudge was made in the same copper kettles. <laughs> I will turn this podcast around. Copper <laughs> kettles? You're just making up words now. <laughs> okay, so it was made in the same copper kettles that were brought, that were, that were brought by the Brown family to L.A. on a... <laughs> To start all over. <laughs> so that stuff was made in the same copper kettles that were brought by the Brown family to LA on a covered wagon when they first moved out here and was done so in the same copper kettles for the restaurant's entire existence. Really? And apparently the Sundays were very delicious. And nutritious. <laughs> so in 1929, Brown's son, Cliff, moved the store to 7007 Hollywood Boulevard, which is just half a block from the Chinese theater. Okay. And it really quickly became a hangout for celebrities and tourists alike. The likes of Mary Pickford, Joan Crawford, Bob Hope, they were all regulars there. United Artist Mary Pickford? The one and only of the United Artists Theater. Call back. Go ahead. Another one. Marlon Brando, he would bring his family there and order his Sunday and then go eat it outside in his limo while his family ate inside. Wow. Yeah. I bet Orson Welles was in limo too. Orson, open up. It's so funny. <laughs> I got you a Sunday, you leave me outside. Take the Sunday. Leave the house, bud. <laughs> <laughs> so, so stupid. So it was a very popular hangout spot for teens and a great place to go out on a first date. Okay. And it was said to have launched a thousand romances. And I was looking up like what people had to say about it. There's so many love stories. Like all the, a lot of very old people went there on their first date and they continued to go there their entire lives with their grandkids and everybody really? just to share like the magic of what it was like. To fall in love with an ice cream sundae. <laughs> How very charming that is. Yeah, it seems like. And they also had, uh, like, it was very old Hollywood. They had, like, dark mahogany uh, oh, really? booths. It was, like a, like, a really nice bar, but they had ice cream. Yeah. yeah. It was a bar. It was kind of like the bar in Clockwork Orange. <laughs> <laughs> Same statues and everything. <laughs> very family friendly. <laughs> so in 1963, a dairy chemist from the Carnation Company named John Schumacher mm -hmm. bought the restaurant from the Browns, Tyler Perry's Meet the Browns, and stayed true to the original recipes and the original wooden decor yeah. for decades. But then the next generation of Schumacher, mm -hmm. they weren't interested in carrying on the tradition of ice cream and the family didn't want to sell to an outsider because they were afraid they would abandon their signature hot fudge recipe for like a cheaper, easier way to make fudge. Mm -hmm. So in 1996, C.C. Brown's closed. Okay. And then there was a brief flare-up in the story. In 2003, there was some sort of weird reincarnation of C.C. Brown's that opened up on Sunset and Vine, mm -hmm. but it very quickly failed, and it was closed again by 2006. So now the C.C. Brown brand is now owned by Laurie's, 
of Lori's Steakhouse. Oh, okay. And that's salt. Yeah. And it's available online, the sauce you can get. Okay. Or in specialty stores. But if you go to some of the high-end Lori's owned restaurants, the CC Brown Hot Fudge Sundae is on the dessert menu. Really? And they prepare it for you right at your table. B word. Yeah. And then any CC Brown Hot Fudge that you get today is still being prepared in those same old Kepper, Kepper pots. Kip, uh, Kipper pots. The, the Kipper pots. <laughs> so regardless, the Hot Fudge Sunday was a major contribution to the country. July 25th is now National Hot Fudge Sunday Day. Day, 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 day. I wonder if that's day. on a Sunday. It can't be. That's, that's against God. <laughs> <laughs> Did you not hear about Evanston? <laughs> <laughs> Nowadays, there's a sign on the light post at the site of the C.C. Browns in Hollywood commemorating the historical spot. The restaurant itself is now a construction site. <laughs> For a giant C.C. Browns empire. <laughs> so, <laughs> we can rebuild it. We have the ice cream. We have the churner. <laughs> that's very interesting. Yeah. So that's, that's, uh, that's a little bit of uh, sweets yeah. after your... Savory, savory dip. The old racism and dip. Next up on the menu. Maybe hope I don't pull one. Chicago deep dish style pizza. <laughs> you, <laughs> you're intolerable. Draw again, one free draw. Chili burger. And this yeah. one again is mine. Yay. Yay, I drew my own. This is working out well. It is, it, it's almost too It's almost well. as if I put magnets on our fingers <laughs> and on the pieces of paper. I read a lot about the origin of the chili burger. Oh, well, first I read a lot about Tommy's, thinking mm -hmm. that's where it originated, but it didn't. It's just Wait the most second. famous. Oh. The first chili burger was not Tommy's. Tomaine Tommy's in 1913 to 1946 was the originator of the chili burger, and it did start over in Lincoln Heights. Ooh. 24 they have 20. a jail there. They do have a jail there. Chili jail. With a, a chili tank. <laughs> Tomaine is spelled P. T O M A I N E. Because he's silly. What the hell is this? I don't know. Wait, what are you telling me, Greg? <laughs> There's a P in the word Tomain. <laughs> it was at 2420 North Broadway. It's originated from a guy named Tommy DeForest. Tomain's Tommy's was a 24 hour chili parlor. A chili Whoa. parlor. He had the, um, mostly chili, but he would serve chili on a, on a burger patty and then he just. Basically, threw buns on it one day, like a burger should be. <laughs> and did the chili size, which is just a burger smothered in chili. Between 1913 and 1958, the force pretty much ran like the burger, <laughs> the burger world in LA, as far as like chili burgers go, because they started to get more and more popular. But basically, around this time, burgers are getting more experimental. And that's the time when you're supposed to experiment with a burger. <laughs> Between 1913 and 1958, the force ran like the burger dome in LA. And it was really famous at the time. Like he claimed that Mae West went there. United artist Mary Pickford went oh there. God. She was a she had horrible eating habits. She really did not go to good places. But yeah, he said that those two were regulars and some other people. Uh, I don't I didn't write their names down. And the rest. <laughs> Tommy and Tommy, as he would call himself. Again, named the place after himself. Would serve straight chili and uh, it would say straight chili out of one bowl. The other one was southwestern variation, which he would smother over a burger since it came from a smaller ladle and he would charge 15 cents and he called it a hamburger size. So that's pretty much, the, you could see the evolution of it becoming just a chili burger. So in 1913, the force bought a lunch wagon for $75 and would just hang around Avenue 22 in Lincoln Heights with a moniker, Texas Tamale Tommy's Tomaine's Tabernacle. He really, went, he really went for it. And in 1929, how many of those had a P in front of it? <laughs> Every single one. <laughs> Texas. <laughs> the hell's up in Texas? <laughs> in 1929, he purchased the property at 2420 and was able to turn his wagon into a shop, which is really great. I wrote The that. original food truck. Yeah, the original. Oh, maybe. Yeah, maybe. it was a backwards back. That is not canon. We don't, <laughs> we don't know if that's true. I read really, I mean, I, I, you know, we read a lot about food and stuff. I wasn't really interested mm -hmm. in any of how food is made. I'm not a foodie, so I don't really care. I don't cook at all. But I did, I, for some reason I wrote this down because it just sounded interesting to me, I don't know why. The chili size or the hamburger size, which was a chili burger, consisted of two hamburger patties about four inches in diameter, which is not that big. Yeah, um, tiny. The beans that cover the patties are soaked in salt water overnight, then cooked in 40 quart pressure cooker. Each patty is covered with half a cup of beans and the other half of chili. Now the chilies were, were made with like uh, tomato puree and canned tomatoes and drained ground beef. Then you throw chili powder in there after the draining, and then you throw some onions in there, bam, you got a chili burger, and it sounds really good. It sounds more like a sloppy good. joe, but with chili, yeah. you know? So yeah, it was very popular for a while. Tommy and Tommy's sold in 1946, and again in 1954, finally closed in 1958. From what I read, Tommy and Tommy 
the forest died eight days later after it was finally closed. Oh. Oh. And they buried him with half a cup of beans. Mm-hmm. And half a half chili. And then they called it, uh, I got nothing. <laughs> Tomain Tommy's traumatic. <laughs> <laughs> Tomain Tommy's was sold in 1946. Also in 1946, Tommy, Tom, Colax opens up a small burger shack on the corner of Beverly and Rampart Boulevard. He paid $800 for this. He originally started with a hot dog stand in around the same area, and he just kind of grew in popularity. This Tommy becomes Tommy's of Tommy's chili burgers. So the guy who made Tommy's, his name actually was Tommy. Tommy, yeah. So there's is that one. why there's so many places that are called like Tommy's with oh, one M? Tom, I'll get to that. Tommy's with, oh. Oh, Tommy's with a P. <laughs> They're all Tommy's with a P. It's just a weird coincidence that the two guys okay. in LA, whose names were Tommy, uh, made chili burgers. Okay. That is very strange. I think it's very strange. I think he's reincarnated. <laughs> he never died, never died, never died. You've been covered in chili all along. <laughs> Actually, the hot dog cart, excuse me, was on Florence and Maine, which is kind of South Central-ish, but not a, it, wasn't, it wasn't Florence and Maine. I know Florida is popular because that's where they pulled that gentleman out of the, uh, his big rig and then beat him on TV during the riots. Greg always has to mention the riots. Yep, he it's, always has. We can check that off on the to-do <laughs> list for this episode. <laughs> Tommy Tom Kolax moved to LA in 1928. I couldn't really figure out where he had moved from. Comes with his family. Like I said, 1946, but moves from a hot dog stand to the Burger Shack. Unlike everybody else, he actually names it after himself. He calls it Tommy's. He, Real trailblazer. Yeah. <laughs> the trailblazer. <laughs> he wanted to go really simple, so he just made hot dogs and hamburgers and covered them in chili, which was the style at the time. It took about 10 years to get really going, and then eventually Tommy's became the hot spot because Belmont High School, which my, where my dad went, was just down the street. So kids would just flock to this place that sold chili burgers for really cheap, and it's still cheap, and they, they got really popular. In the 50s, uh, he would keep supplies in the trunk of his car and ice filled Coca Cola coolers. Because uh, it was a hot spot of, of Belmont, so he would like want to get a little bit closer. He wanted to make sure he had enough room for all the comedy of the kids that came out of school. One of them probably, I don't know, my dad's a little older than that. Or he's a little <laughs> younger than that. Uh, in the 60s, he was able to buy the whole property, which means the uh, parking uh, right there, the extended eat lunch counters, and the second counter where you go order food from, although it's not as fast and it's not the original shack. Mm -hmm. A couple of years later, he buys the parking lot across the street where a lot of fights break out. <laughs> so your dad ate at the original cart? No, no, no. He, he he went to school in what the '60s, '70s. Yeah. So it was already established. Already, it was already. Uh, it was already. In I wish your dad was older. <laughs> That's what all the ladies say. <laughs> he was there probably for a filming of Kojak or something. <laughs> Around <Give me> a burger. <laughs> <laughs> you skip on the chili, I'll kill you. <laughs> so '60s and '70s, all of LA begins to flock to Tommy's shack. And they, it's kind of described as a place where like the highbrow and lowbrow, like like a, like what I think it was described as like where a white collar comes to feel like blue collar. Which is, <laughs> I don't know what the hell that means. I, I were, you were gonna say collar. <laughs> <after you said. laughs> <laughs> it's where the whites come and hang out with the blues. <laughs> All of LA begins to flock to, to uh, Tommy's. And over the next two decades, it opens different locations. There's one in Eagle Rock, there's one in Tahunga, there's one in Van Nuys, there's one in the Northridge Mall, which is very close to us right now. Wait a minute, what year was the Northridge Mall one open? I don't get the exact dates for a phone, oh. but over the next couple decades. And then there's a bunch of knockoffs like Tammy's, Tawny's, Tommy's, Tom's, Tommy's with the IE, I mean. And they're all just basically the same thing, but they don't, they're just not a Tommy's burger. So they're just trying to get away with... They just thought people would be like, oh, Tommy's. Exactly. Just by taking and the name. It's basically like um, like the music industry. Like we don't have... We, Taylor Swift won't sing the song about Sprite. So we'll get someone who looks like her name, like Tawny Quift. And then we'll make her sing about Sprite. <laughs> Tyler <laughs> Agile. <laughs> so uh, Tommy, Colax passes in 1992. Tommy's original shack is still a must-stop shop. Must-stop Wow, I'm gonna start all of this over. <laughs> must stop, must shop. <laughs> what am I shopping? I'm just bags of <laughs> chili burgers. Just loose chili <laughs> dripping, <laughs> dripping out of the bags. You want this in a box? No, 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 in the bag is fine. <laughs> Do you want it laminated first? <laughs> no. no, no. Put a straw in it. Oh, oh, oh boba straw. <laughs> oh, oh, stop. Big Tommy, Tom Colex, passes in 1992, uh, but Tommy's original shack is still the like the must stop spot for tourists. People leaving Dodger games. Mm -hmm. It's open really late. It's open to like think three in the morning. It's uh, incredibly affordable, <laughs> and the burgers are come out just like um, fully based. It's really quick. They put out burgers really quick because they have a lot of uh, people working in the small little shack that are always sweating and serving me burgers. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know where the sweat ends and the <laughs> chili begins. <laughs> but it, it is. I can attest to the deliciousness. Tommy's is uh, unlike any other chili burger that's around. 
I'm not a huge fan. I know you're not. Also, this is your, your over too with me. So no, oh, no, don't worry. I'm, I, I, I'm not. I'm not here to impress you. You don't. You've also never been to the original Shack either, which is no. a really nice spot. I think their their hamburgers are very good. Their their chili looks like dog diarrhea. Yeah, it looks like a dog has eaten diarrhea and then re diarrheas it. Yeah, you you you're one of those people that irritates me. That goes to Tommy's <laughs> like, no chili, please. Going to McDonald's like, yeah, just just keep the second bun and two patties. I'll just have the lettuce and, and the top. Give bun. me the sesame seeds. <laughs> a bag of sesame seeds. There's a photo of like opening day. I think it's when he bought the entire lot and like bought the second counter. They had like that big opening day for Tommy's. And my dad's friend is reportedly in that picture. Uh, Eddie, who the also, one that they have in all of the uh, yeah, in all the, in all the Tommy's. Yeah, he's reportedly in that shot somewhere. And this is also a gentleman that uh, supposedly, I don't know if this is true, but a lot of people say that he went on the first slow speed chase in like <laughs> LA because he opened a beer and he had a warrant for it. So they were going to pull him over. He's like, well, I'm just going to finish this beer. <laughs> I know I'm going to jail as soon as they pulled me over. So I'm just going to finish this. So that's how this Tom, Tommy story ends. Another Eddie proud Soto. historical figure <laughs> in Los Angeles. <laughs> So uh, that's basically the chili burger. Two toms are involved in the chili burger. Mm -hmm. That's all you need to make chili, two toms. But I like that that the story, I, I had no idea that it starts. I mean, I, I always like the area periphery of downtown, but it also goes to Lincoln Heights, which yeah. I'm also a big fan of Lincoln Heights and Highland Park. You say your French dip was your best story. I like that one better so far. Oh, thanks. No, I like I like the Tommy. Oh, I you like, like the, the chili tom better. You like the, the chili story better. better. The chili's better. The chili's just better because it wasn't made accidentally. It's two guys <laughs> who know what they're doing. All right. Draw. All right, here we go. Bang. Oh, cheeseburger. Uh, cheeseburger. You're not done yet. Well, I'm gonna get all my talking out the way. <laughs> We're gonna talk about the right spot. Which right. one? Right aid. Right spot, R I T E, just like <laughs> right aid. Responsible for the cheeseburger. Mm -hmm. It originates in Pasadena, but it's more closer when I looked it up to Eagle Rock. It's on the. Even better. It's on the west side of the Suicide Bridge. It's the another one. Oh, the Embankment of Lost Souls. That, oh, that's the one. Yeah. Wayne Manor. It is 1500 West Colorado Boulevard, which is still a thing. It's at Colorado and Avenue 64, much I said, right around the edge of uh, Eagle Rock. Okay. It's the man responsible is a man named Lionel Clark Sternberger, home of Sternberger. Can I take your order? <laughs> God, I've been waiting two days. Uh, who, who loves orange cheese? <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, Lionel Clark Sternberger was a short order cook. <laughs> That's the whole story. He was a short order cook. So obviously, he made a cheeseburger. <laughs> what more do you want? Supposedly, this one was accidental too, but I, I, I'm not going to give that. I, I think this young man knew what he was doing. He was reportedly uh, 16 at the time. A lot of people speculate. It must have happened between 1923 and 1926. And he was just a short order cook at the time. I heard with this... He first did it when the right spot used to be a um, just like a food stand at the side, of, like a road stop sign. That's so like hamburgers, tobacco, and fruit. Tobacco? Tobacco, yeah. It tastes like grandma. The original cheeseburger was called the aristocratic burger. It was just a hamburger with cheese, and it was 15 cents. Imagine that. Rip off. Rip off. We know about um, the right spot due to menus found at the Pasadena Museum of History. But I, I've read a lot of articles about it. The, the menus is probably the best thing. They just they, they list the address for the right spot. Uh, they list him as the cook, and they list the aristocratic burger, and this was all in the 20s. So it has to be one of the first spots because the patents for cheeseburgers in other cities across the country were already um, You can patent their, a cheeseburger? You can patent anything. Can I patent you? I'm already patented as that guy from Bones. You know the one. <laughs> Lionel and his twin brother, Van, he had a twin brother, moved from New York to Highland Park sometime between 1910 and 1920, and they were both pretty young. The right spot that eventually it became was uh, just like a quick lunch counter quick service uh, and it had like bistro tables and whatnot. Apparently the story is just him slapping and it's just, he, he was just somebody who was like, oh, cheese and a burger, why, why wouldn't this be good? So he wasn't carrying around a slice of cheese and tripped over something <laughs> and then it slammed on. Oh no, I gotta save it. <laughs> hey. <laughs> one story, uh, the stories for this one are kind of funny. One of the stories, the speculating story is that there was a passing homeless man who made a suggestion to Sternberger to just add a slice of cheese to his hamburger order. Here's a clue to why I don't think that's true. It's called the aristocratic burger. <laughs> Maybe it was a joke. Maybe it's a joke. Maybe it's, it's a joke. Ironic name. name. I kind of thought about that too. Like if that's a true story, like that's such a dick move to do. It is very yeah. mean. One other story that I also read a lot of was that it was, uh, he accidentally burned one side of the patty and to cover it up, he just threw a slice of cheese uh -huh. on it. I was like, oh, it's not burned. Enjoy this 
cheeseburger. <laughs> My favorite story is that he thought it was a good idea and proceeded. <laughs> so they opened up a second ride spot in Highland Park, a little closer to their place after the success of the first one. Like I said, in the 30s, uh, it was uh, very popular. Not only the ride spot, but just cheeseburgers in general. Like I said, burgers were starting to get a little more experimental. You had uh, Tommy and Tommy's doing chi uh, chili burgers and uh, the cheeseburgers was coming around. The double burger was somewhere, I'm sure, but it was invented some other bohunk thing. Bo-punk. Podunk. Podunk. They say that, that the popularity of burgers, although it, I, I'm sure it's German because the word is super German, but they say the popularity of burgers in, our, in America starts around like 1893 from street vendors around like the World's Fair in Chicago and then this kind of slowly moves west like everything else. In Louisville, Kentucky, there was a place called Kalen's Restaurant and a man in 1934 coined the term cheeseburger, which if Sternberger had been smart and just like cheeseburger, cheeseburger, like a, like cheese plus burger equals cheeseburger, but he had to be wisecracked and called yeah, the aristocratic. The aristocrat he, burger. So he doesn't have the patent on the What term. do you call this burger? The aristocrat. <laughs> Another uh, diner in Denver filed a patent in 1935, the Humpty Dumpty Drive-In. Um, Sternberger passes away in 1964, apparently weighed 425 pounds at the time of his death. <laughs> Not a surprise. No wife, no kids, no nope. obituary notes. This sounds all too accurate. <laughs> in his obituary, it, it is noted that he uh, is credited with inventing the cheeseburger. When with brother... inventing heart disease. <laughs> <laughs> when his brother Van dies, it notes that his brother invented the cheeseburger. <laughs> Pretty sad. Here's an interesting story. Uh, Finally. <laughs> Lionel loaned a man named Bob Wayne some money in 1936 to open up his own uh, burger restaurant. It's now known as Bob's Big Boys. You know, Bob's Big Boys. From Austin Powers? Mm -hmm. That's the one. So in 1964, uh, when Sternberger dies, McDonald's, only 20 years old at the time, had released its first annual report. A year before that, they had sold their billionth burger. <laughs> Cheeseburger Week in Pasadena is between January 12th and 17th. National Cheeseburger Day is oh. September 18th. Recommended burger places in Pasadena, the Pie and Burger. Yeah. Killer, 1913 East California Boulevard in Pasadena. Delicious ice cream. Delicious ice cream. Maybe the best vanilla ice cream I've ever had. And you can't distinguish between butter and vanilla ice cream. <laughs> yeah, so delicious. you eat it all. Yeah. Oh, also I was going to mention this because it's kind of a callback. Mm -hmm. um, around the time that the burger starts... The library. <laughs> Griffith Park is cursed. <laughs> Beware! <laughs> in the twenties, when the when he's first putting the burger together, the cheeseburger, excuse me, together the in the right spot, burger. the aristocratic burger, aristocratic burger. Sorry, uh, we have that happening. Highland Park. We have uh, the chili burgers coming around. A Pasadena at the time is a tourist spot, and get this, a winter resort for entrepreneurs from the east because it's sunny climates. So people who hate the snowy Christmas come to LA. They stay at the Huntington Hotel, which is very beautiful. And they, they get their kicks. Around the 20s, Mount Wilson installs a 100-inch telescope Griffith would see and get inspired by. Mm -hmm. But uh, speaking of hamburger experimentation, yes. there's also a lot of hamburger experimentation going on in L.A. right now. There is a lot of fusion is, stuff. Yeah, and it's spreading to uh, other... It, I know New York is trying to copy it. Finally, <laughs> the opposite direction. I, know. I hear a lot of good things about Unami Burger, but unami. I... Um, what did I say? Unami. What, what, That's what a very it? offensive word in Japanese. <laughs> we got we got to scratch up. <laughs> umami, yeah, it's, umami, it's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, mm. yeah. I like um, I like the burgers I make. Quite frankly, <laughs> I, I I think they're best in town. Come to humbly named Greg's Burgers, <laughs> Greggies, Greggies. All my places have been named after the people who came up with them. Yeah. Mr. Right Spot. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> but Bob's big boy. Uh, Ronald McDonald. <laughs> <laughs> you were going to say something, I cut you off. Well, no, it's just that it's I, like LA is uh, hamburger central. It we is. We sort of dominate, we dictate the fashion of hamburgers <laughs> around the whole country. I guess the rest of the show is mine. I guess so. Unfortunately, you're going to pull it out to be surprising yeah. still. Let's see. What do we, what, what, what can we have? Oh, well, well. oh Orange Julius! <laughs> Alright, so Orange Julius. Hit me with it, physically. Don't make me. <laughs> Orange Julius, a delicious mall snack staple that has history deeply rooted, because mm -hmm. oranges grow on trees which have roots, in oh, LA oh. history that you probably weren't expecting or hoping for, yeah. but that I have to give to you. Yeah. Please. It has to do with this city's extremely long and weird relationship and obsession with juice. <laughs> the year was in 1769. Oh. The earth was young. 
the city was younger. <laughs> Junipero Serra, uh-huh. in this year, planted the first citrus seeds the region had seen at the area's missions. Okay. So the seeds are believed to have come from southeast China, where such plants had been growing for thousands of years. So by the 1840s, the first commercial citrus farm was started by the granddaddy, air quotes, you can't see, I forgot, okay. of California's citrus business, a man named William Wolfskill. Wow. <laughs> yeah. In what is now downtown LA. He couldn't have started a commercial citrus farm at a more perfect time because around this period also the California gold rush was going on mm. and citrus was in high demand among the prospectors to help combat scurvy. I was going to make a scurvy joke. Yeah. It's not a joke. It's not a Do you joke. know how many old prospectors <laughs> we lost? How many minor 49ers we lost? <laughs> on this farm, he grew oranges and lemons, but in the 1870s, the navel orange was introduced to the world thanks mm. to Riverside. Mm. Boom. And that's when California became the orange hub of the country. So the navel orange was so revolutionary because it was sweet. Okay. It was seedless. It grew in the winter of L.A. And it looked like a belly button. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Flash forward 50 years and L.A. is a major producer of the country's oranges. So so many orange groves around, logically... A man named Julius Freed came along Mm -hmm. and figured that when life gives you oranges, make lemonade. So in 1926, Freed opened up an orange juice stand. I contacted the Dairy Queen, and they had no idea what the first location of his stand was, but they believed that it it was mobile and would move around from location to location. They believed that there may have been a more permanent location in West Hollywood at one point. I also used, I'm going to plug the library right now, I used a service where you can text in any question to reference, and they answered me that day. It was really impressive. So they said that the address they found was at 7th and Broadway, which is right near where the state... The theater state theater, is, yeah. The state theater is right With there. With two, two big openings on both sides because it was the busiest intersection. Mm-hmm. Because there's Orange Julius there. And it, it was also uh, five blocks from where the original C.C. Brown's Hot Fudge Sunday place okay. was. What that address is, that might have been the first location open that actually had the name Orange Julius right. on it. So in the beginning, it was just the stand that sold orange juice. But not long after he opened up his stand, Freed's real estate broker slash friend Mm, that's you put i'm sure you picked that order correctly his name is bill hamlin and he made a contribution to his friend's business so hamlin really loved oranges and orange juice but the problem was that all the acid from drinking it upset his stomach oh i know which, what he, yeah. which is uh another thing he's like the guy who had weak gums or whatever for the french dip story yeah. so hamlin who he had a background in chemistry he decided to take the orange juice Blend it up with some milk, sugar, vanilla extract, an egg, and some ice to make it less acidic and more tolerable for his stomach. So the resulting drink, it turned very frothy and smooth and delicious. Because it had rabies. It's foaming at the straw. (laughs) So he showed this drink to Julius, and Julius started to sell it. So the drink quickly became a hit with his customers, who would come to his stand and say, Give me an orange, Julius. Cute. And thus, the orange Julius was born. (laughs) Orange comma Julius. It's a long line of people with acid reflux. I know. <laughs> they dictated the, the country's eating habits. That was the only medicine at the time. So the orange stand, which before the Orange Julius was invented, it brought in around $20 a day. And then after the Orange Julius, it started taking in over $100 a day. Wow. So Julius's stand became so successful that by 1929, he had 100 Orange Julius locations, which is three years after he first opened his dinky little stand. So the Orange Julius was the forerunner for the smoothie craze that soon grabbed hold of the nation pretty much from then on. So smoothies existed in a way for a long time before the Orange Julius in Brazil in the form of blended fruit juice and ice, but the Orange Julius adapted it to American tastes and brought it into American mouths. (laughs) So the timing of all this was just perfect for the country. Refrigerators became available to, to have in your house in 1915, But it wasn't until the 30s, when Orange Julius was just starting to blow up, that they stopped leaking ammonia and killing everybody. (laughs) So around this time, uh, also frozen food was becoming popular, so people were able to keep fresh fruit and milk in their own kitchens. So also around this time, the blender was invented, and all of this equals you can make your own fruit smoothies in the comfort of your own kitchen. Ah. 
also around this time, and also, <laughs> bodybuilding started to become a thing, uh -huh. and Jack LaLanne started to promote exercising and juicing mm -hmm. to stay healthy. Steroids. Yeah. It was all great for Orange Julius because even though um, it's pretty much just a watery milkshake, ice cream started to be perceived as bad. Chubby food. Chubby food, but smoothies were seen as healthy. Healthy food. Healthy food. Yeah. So things were going great for Orange Julius until the depression hit and then World War II. And it slowed down expansion. But then once the 50s came along, they started to rise yet again. And around that time, shopping malls started to pop up around the country. Mm. And Orange Julius capitalized on this immediately to extreme success. They started setting up shop right next door to popular stores like JCPenney and Woolworths, which is where they are still this day. Woolworths is not, but they're usually they next like the to Woolworths. JC Penney or something. They, they said, uh, and stay off the Orange Julius. And go get an orange juice. <laughs> so once the 60s hit, the macrobiotic and health food movement came along. Mm -hmm. And Orange Julius experienced yet another popularity boost. In 1964, Orange Julius became the official drink of the 1964 World's Fair in Queens. Really? Then in 1965, Johnny Carson was given a lifetime pass to all Orange Juliuses in America. And he slept with all the women. In 1977, the first Orange Julius opened in Hong Kong. The 80s saw a resurgence in the bodybuilding craze of the 30s. Right. So they wanted to... <laughs> they all had mustaches and dumbbells. <laughs> hoi, 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 hoi. So they wanted to appeal to this new customer base. So the egg in the recipe was replaced by a banana to make it more muscle friendly. Okay. And that's why there's a banana. Okay. You taste so much banana. Yeah. Banana. Banana. In 1987, the Orange Julius brand was bought by Dairy Queen, where it still resides today. There's somewhere between 800 to 1,000 Dairy Queens in the country that you can get an Orange Julius in. I can only find six locations that are still in L.A. Burbank. But the impact that the Orange Julius had on L.A. is still felt as evidenced by the current juice-centric diet that we're currently in the middle of. Right. So to clear up a few things about Orange Julius, their slogan used to be a devilishly good drink, and their logo had a little devil with a pitchfork sitting on an orange. How did that go over? You, you know that nursery rhyme? <laughs> devil with a pitchfork sitting on an orange. <laughs> but Arizona State University felt it was too similar to their mascot, which was a devil with a pitchfork. <laughs> Satan lives. Their motto. <laughs> <laughs> Arizona State University. God Satan is dead. Lives. <laughs> All is lost. <laughs> So they were intimidated into the changing the logo to what it is now. The creator of Smoothie King, which that have you ever smoothie exactly? King. It's a Louisiana-based smoothie chain that I have never heard You're of. Married to the Dairy Queen, she has her own district. <laughs> so this guy named Steve Kunow. Okay. He claims to be the inventor of the smoothie, but Julius Fried was making them decades before he was <laughs> even born. <laughs> Kunow was lactose intolerant. Again. So his smoothies had no dairy in them, so we can give him that, non-dairy smoothies. So one last thing, you might read, you might, you know, obviously you're going to want to fact check everything we just said. Yeah, you're going to need to. So you might read some wild rumors online that Julius Fried invented a shower stall for pigeons and that he was friends with Cecil B. DeMille, but this was all a hoax that Dairy Queen used as a publicity stunt to, I don't know what their goal was, don't believe Why? any of it. Uh, yeah, they they wanted to lie. That down with the queen. <laughs> the hoax was uncovered by none other than Ken Jennings, the Jeopardy champion. Really? Yeah, that's just doing funny. his part. <laughs> so that's the Orange Julius. Let's see what else is. In the oh, bag. you don't have one of your joke ones anymore. <laughs> no. Spanish yogurt. <laughs> <laughs> that's a Texas omelet. <laughs> Last to sort of help you digest before mm -hmm. you all go to bed. Mm -hmm. The Cobb salad. This, of all the things we've done, is maybe the most iconic and widely spread dish yeah. ever created in L.A., if not particularly the most appealing to anyone born after the year 1950. <laughs> but people say you can judge the caliber of a restaurant based on how well they do a Cobb salad. So it's not just an iconic dish of L.A. The Cobb salad was invented in one of the most iconic restaurants in L.A., the Brown Derby. Tell me more. So, no, I'm done. Good night! <laughs> So anyone who knows anything about, anyone who's worth their salt of old Hollywood knows that the Brown Derby was the place where movie stars were fed. And anyone who knows anything about how weird Hollywood can be knows that the Brown Derby is that restaurant that used to exist that was shaped like a giant hat. It was shaped like a giant bowling hat. Mm -hmm. So there are a few stories, again, about why they decided that a hat was the best object to model a restaurant after. 
Some say it was modeled after the hat that Al Smith, who was a presidential candidate at the time, was wearing when he visited in L.A., which is a, a, a really absurd thing to latch on to. Let's, let's spend all this money building this restaurant shaped like a hat to honor this person who was... <laughs> Surely history won't forget Al Smith. <laughs> you know, the football player? <laughs> <laughs> so another story is that it was a play on the saying that if you knew enough about food, you could sell it out of a hat. But the story that sounds most likely is that Herbert K. Somborn, who's an ex-wife of Gloria Swanson, Gloria Swanson, postulated that if you made good food, people would come to eat it, even if your restaurant was shaped like a hat. So in 1926, he did. <laughs> the first location was at the intersection of Wilshire Boulevard in Alexandria. Mm -hmm. It was right across the street from the Ambassador Hotel, which no longer exists also. Because they shot RFK there, and they thought, well, let's just knock this guy down. Really? They That's where it happened? Yeah, Ambassador Hotel. Oh, my God. Three other locations would open up, but this was the only one that looked like an actual brown derby hat. So yeah. that's the one. Yeah. Well, sort of. Som <laughs> Somborn recruited a man named Robert H. Cobb, who from now on will be known as Bob Cobb, <laughs> to run the place for him. And in the beginning, Bob Cobb literally did all the jobs in the place except cook. Mm -hmm. And sometimes he would even cook. So being right across from one of the city's major hotels, the restaurant quickly started to attract a glitzy clientele. And they right. started to grow a very respectable reputation. Where history really happened was at the Hollywood and Vine location on 1628 Vine right. that opened up on Valentine's Day, 1929. Since this one was so close to the TV, radio, and movie studios, this became a hub for celebrities to come get food before, during, and after work on the <laughs> set. Some things were even filmed in the restaurant itself. Every big Hollywood celebrity was a regular there. Clark Gable proposed to Carol Lombard there. Mm. The management capitalized on all this celebrity by heavily advertising it as the place celebrities came to eat. And they would put up caricatures of all the regular celebrities on the wall. It was so recognized nationwide that this was where celebrities were, that the restaurant would get fan mail that was just addressed to the Brown Derby, Hollywood and Vine, <laughs> give to Clark Gable. <laughs> so the layout of the restaurant was such that everybody was looking at each other from all of their booths. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a place to be seen. And of course, all the waitresses uh, were actresses, and they would be dropping silverware and provocatively bending over ah. and picking it up in front of the really powerful movie executives. I knew that they were in there. I knew it. This location mm -hmm. was, it was open 24 hours a day and started providing a table side phone service for celebrities oh, wow. that simply must be reached during <laughs> their meals. So this was the location where it all happened. The exact story varies. Some accounts say the year was 1929, others say it was 1937. One theory says that one of the chefs at the restaurant made it in Bob Cobb's honor, mm -hmm. but the most widely and accepted and more interesting version of the story is that Bob Cobb, who became president of the restaurant in 1934 after Somborn died, Bob Cobb is the cousin of Ty Cobb. Ty, the furious tornado racist baseball player cop. Mm -hmm. Big salad fan though. Yeah, they were cousins. Really? Yeah. Terrifying. I know. So there's an insight of where the salad is coming from. <laughs> Bob Cobb was hanging out with a few of his celebrity friends in the restaurant late one night. Who the friends were varies a lot, but what seems to be agreed upon was that Sid Grauman was there oh. and they wanted something to eat. So Bob Cobb went into the kitchen and rummaged around for what he could piece together. And what he found was iceberg lettuce, watercress, romaine, chicory, tomato, roasted chicken, some cooked bacon, avocado, hard-boiled egg, chives, Rockfort cheese, and French dressing. He, yeah, my, I'm salivating. Yeah, say the egg part again. <laughs> How hard-boiled was it? <laughs> so the salad he made out of this was such a hit that his famous friends started requesting it when they came, and word started to spread around town, and thus, the world's most glamorous but disgusting salad was born. <laughs> so the guidelines for how to prepare the salad became scripture, with all the lettuce and the toppings required to be finely chopped to no larger than, I think, one-fourth of an inch. Wow. And then all the other ingredients were laid out on top of the chopped greens in colorful stripes. And the salad was such a huge hit, it's still around, the popularity further propelled the Brown Derby brand. In 1931, a third location in Beverly Hills on Wilshire and Rodeo opened up. The fourth location opened up in Los Feliz mm -hmm. at 4500 Los Feliz Boulevard at the intersection with Hillhurst in 1941. So the Los Feliz location, it's interesting because it was originally a Willard's chicken restaurant, 
when it opened up in 1929, but Cecil B. DeMille bought it, turned it into a brown derby. But the location, it latched on to the new crave of drive-in restaurants. Right. So it had a car hop service that you could eat in your car if you didn't want to go into the fancy dining room. They'll stay in my car. And who doesn't want to eat a Cobb salad out of their window? <laughs> this location also, it had a dome on top that mm-hmm. was able to have water pumped to the top of the dome. And then it would run down the sides and cool off the building, which makes it one of the first air-conditioned restaurants. And like most things, the Brown Derby restaurant chain didn't last as the city began to evolve. Mm -hmm. The Los Feliz branch closed in 1960. It became a nightclub called the Derby for a while. And then that closed. In the early 2000s, it was at risk for being demolished and replaced with condos and a supermarket. The neighborhood revolted fought for it to get historical landmark protection status, which it did in 2006. Right now, it's a restaurant called Mess Hall. And the only Brown Derby building that is still standing is that one. Yeah. So the Hollywood location was closed by 1980, and the building itself was badly burned in 1987, and then just sort of stayed there until 2001, until it was just demolished. The Beverly Hills location was demolished in 1983. Mm -hmm. The original location was gone by 1985, but the Korean strip mall that's now there, it kept the dome embedded in its structure. The Brown Derby got a new name, a new watered-down second life in the form of a Disney World location in 1987 after the Brown Derby name was licensed to Disney. (laughs) Yeah, a few other Disney Presents Brown Derby locations are at the Disneylands in Paris and Tokyo, they, uh, they also support supposedly created chiffon cake and some sort of great food. Really? Cake. The 80s was not a kind time to the Brown Derby. No, but it was very kind for Disney. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't the 80s seem like the complete opposite of like golden age Hollywood? Yep. Like the 80s is just saved by the bell. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was our meal. Yeah, it was, and it was um, stale. It was a little, a little bit drippy. Mm-hmm. Could, have been, could have had more salt. Uh, we ate it in a good order, though. <laughs> Salad lasts. <laughs> if anyone needs to be burped, you can send an email. When I was doing the research, it was making me hungry. But now that, that I have, there's a mess of donuts and coffee in front of me. I'm <laughs> never going to eat again. All this food sounds disgusting. Yeah, now I was I saying eat. chili burger so much that I was starting to, my stomach was starting to turn. <laughs> I always knew the Cobb salad was gross. But now that I know exactly what's in it, it makes me want to vomit. I'm going to eat it. Not Let us eat. agree that... Let us not talk about any of these foods No, again. no. I'll, I'll see you at Orange Julius tomorrow. What time do they open? <laughs> I'll be there half an hour before that. It's orange juice, so it's breakfast. Um, I know there's going to be a long line, so I want to get there early. <laughs> <laughs> after this breaks, after this episode <laughs> after comes out. After we drop it. <laughs> what do you like to eat in LA? I'm curious. Doesn't matter uh, if it originated here. Uh, I like a lot. Of, the places I like to eat are just little places, yeah. like little Korean strip mall uh, with a brown derby <laughs> with the on brown top. With brown derby yeah. But the places I find that are most hyped are not that impressive to yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. We, we are always slightly disappointed when we eat those places together. Mm-hmm. Five star. My toe. Have you ever been to the cafeteria at the observatory? It's really good. No. Kind of I hear they have some great uh, tuna. They also have Supernova. Supernova. I can finally use it. <laughs> I, I was hoping there would be more uh, Mexican food history mm-hmm. to Los Angeles. I read supposedly that the first burrito on a menu was in L.A., but I couldn't find proof to back that up. Yeah. The burrito certainly wasn't invented in L.A. No. You had a long list when we first started doing research. Yeah, they of, like, slowly, slowly did dwindled. not pan out. Shirley Temple's. I see. I was looking up. I was trying. I was wanted to find like a cocktail that was made in LA, but none of them were except yeah. like like a, a broken bottle of wine. Except in whatever the 20s. killed John Barrymore. <laughs> it has no name. <laughs> <laughs> Liquid death. Barry less. <laughs> John Barry me again. We urge you, all of you who aren't doing it. We know someone's listening. Someone has to. Someone's touching the download button. Yeah. I can hear a tone. Computer says. Um. <laughs> so leave a review on iTunes if you can. And you can visit us at allameekly.tumblr.com. Follow us. You can follow us. We might make stickers soon. We're hopefully talking. $50 per sticker. Yeah. That sounds fair. Leave your credit card information on the iTunes review. We'll take care of the rest. (laughs) Yet another episode. Thank you. And catchphrase pending. Bye. Say bye. Bye. I don't want to say bye. (laughs)